Good morning, welcome everyone. Today we have a special guest speaker for our Grand Rounds. Dr. Kaveh Sharjania went to medical school, actually undergrad in medical school at the University of Manitoba uh, in Winnipeg, Canada, and then did his residency at the Brigham and Women's and was an assistant professor at UCSF up until 2004 when he moved to the University of Ottawa and then moved uh, in 2008 to become an associate professor in the Department of Medicine at the University of Toronto. He also has cross appointments in multiple other departments, including the Department of Health Policy and Biomedical Engineering. And he is the director of the University of Toronto Center for Quality Improvement and Patient Safety, as well as the editor-in-chief of BMJ Quality and Safety, which is the leading publication on quality and safety out there. He has won many awards. He's won awards for research and patient safety uh, from his time at UCSF, and also uh, Canada Research Chairs Program Award, Continuing Education Awards, mentorship awards, the list goes on and on. And he has done a lot of research. He has about 100 peer-reviewed journal publications, mostly on quality and safety. He's done many technical reports, and he has a lot of grants. He's done oral presentations, lectures, letters, books, book chapters, more publications. Point being, he knows how to publish. And he is here today to talk to us about that, that very project. His talk for us is entitled Achieving Synergy Between Designing Quality Improvement Projects and Writing Them Up for Publication. Please welcome Dr. Shojania. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much for that very kind introduction. Um, I, I realized actually as I got up here that this is an odd looking title for a Grand Rounds thing. And, and so let me just explain that uh, I think everybody knows that quality improvement has become of interest uh, lately. Um, and I, I find that there's two types of people who get involved with it. One are researchers who don't really think it's very interesting, but grudgingly recognize that it's important to do now and people are asking them to do it. And then enthusiastic clinicians who don't really have much of a background in writing and they sort of pour two years of their life into a project that doesn't work or maybe it seems to work and they try unsuccessfully to get it published. And so I give a lot of talks to both types of people and I found that actually thinking about the project and how it will eventually be written up can have, be very synergistic. Before I go on, um, this is a cartoon I discovered about 10 years ago, and it's become for me the sort of epitome of so much work and quality improvement. It's a Rube Goldberg uh, uh, cartoon. You may, many of you, especially the older people in the audience, may remember that expression. That's a Rube Goldberg device. It was a very Rube Goldberg was a cartoonist in the Depression who became famous for drawing complicated ways of doing simple things. And this was his pencil sharpener. And the pencil sharpener begins with opening this window, which releases a kite that opens the cage of the moths. The moths fly out and start eating this coat. As the coat gets lighter, it lowers the boot that flips the switch on the iron. It burns the flannel shirt, smokes out the possum, who jumps into the basket, raises the woodpecker's cage, eats the pencil. Uh, and if all else fails, there's a pencil uh, knife over here to sharpen the pencil. So why do I show this? Because this is the hospital medicu medication system. This is the process for admitting patients to the hospital, right? You know, um, and no matter how well you think you know the system, you don't realize all, all the steps that are involved. And even when you're a thoughtful clinician or a manager and you get together and you try to figure out how to solve this problem, you really only know about like this one little area over here with the woodpecker. And so it seems like, like logical. Why don't we just add another woodpecker? Then the pencil will be even sharper. So here's an example of adding another woodpecker, right? You know, if, this is a real patient. This was actually sent to me by some friends from UCSF shortly after I left UCSF. So, you know, this was a real patient transferred from another hospital. Oops, sorry. Um, you know, the white, the white one is a real... Um, he spoke English and was quite intelligent, but the hospital hadn't sent a legend for what any of these bands meant. And the white one was the regular patient ID. I think the red one was some kind of medication allergy. One of them was a tape allergy. One of them was a fall risk. They never figured out what the yellow one was. <laughs> so in any case, the point is, is this, this Rube Goldberg situation, sorry, is it really emphasizes the messiness of practice settings. It's hard to understand the target problems. It's difficult to attribute uh, effects to any intervention you make amid the noise of randomness and other deliberate changes. There's lots of implementation challenges, as you can imagine, with all these like 50 steps in the process. There's also unintended consequences. 
So it makes having a theory to guide you very helpful. I don't mean a grand theory. I mean like a lot of times in quality improvement, people skip the basic step of like, why are you even doing a checklist or an order set or a performance report card? Like why that particular solution to this particular problem? And here's an example of how this sort of plays it out. This is a common QI report. This one's sort of how researchers would write it. They would say, like, hospital infections are really important. And then some studies suggest that, that staff education, clinical champions, and maybe empowering patients to ask staff if they wash their hands are good things. So it's time to do a randomized control trial. And, you know, the problem with this, there's a number of problems with this, but one of them, which I'll talk about a little bit later, is this idea of rushing to do a randomized trial before you've optimized this intervention. But the problem is, is there's no real connection between the introductory material and the specific features of the intervention. Yeah, we know there's a lot of infections, um, but why specifically if you're going to try to improve hand hygiene, would you pick these particular interventions? It's like, that's this is the classic uh, paper. It's, you know, heart failure is really bad, therefore we did X, but it doesn't really say, yeah, we know heart failure is bad, but if you're gonna try to improve heart failure care, you gotta talk a little bit about why heart failure care is not optimal. It's not enough to just say that heart failure is a bad thing or infections are a bad thing. So, for instance, a better, introduction might say that you can sort of take for granted that germs are a bad thing and they kill people. What we really want to know is that what are the common barriers to hand hygiene and that this, these elements of this intervention address these barriers in the following way. Uh, now the reason that I'm showing this is that, you know, ideally before rush, I mean, it would be an improved writing piece of writing to lay out your introduction that way, but in quality improvement, unlike in regular clinical research, we don't get that much out of the negative trials. Like it's different when somebody is saying something's a wonderful thing and they're thinking about mandating it at the Joint Commission, sure, then you should have a randomized trial, but it isn't like there's a drug out there that we want to know if it actually works. If you develop a quality improvement strategy and then just rush and do a negative randomized trial, it's like big deal. You haven't really learned anything. So ideally you would try to make sure the intervention is working as well as possible. Uh, the other thing is, is that a lot of times researchers make the mistake of rushing to do the only the outcome that measures success. And you don't really even know if the intervention worked as it was supposed to work. So for instance, we don't know if hand hygiene even improved. We don't know if staff knowledge improved maybe. We don't know if, um, basically it would be like if you did a, a drug trial and you don't know if patients took the medications. Well, then you don't really know when you have a negative trial if it's because the patients didn't take the medication or if the drug doesn't work. It happens like that in quality improvement a lot. So before I go on to how to do sort of a, a um, to think about these things synergistically, the other type of common quality improvement report I see is sort of the look we, we did it approach. It's, um, you know, again, hand, hospital infections are really, really bad. We implemented a multifaceted strategy and then the result so are almost like, oh my God, we increase hand hygiene compliance by 50% and the discussion is our hard work paid off and patient engagement is a wonderful thing. So they're very like uncritical, enthusiastic people. Again, you have no real idea of why this thing was even supposed to work and they're claiming this outrageous effect size, um, sometimes even that they save people's lives. And you know, you really have to question um, the value of that. And I sometimes think about it in terms of that, um, remember that book, The Battle Hymn of the Tiger Mother that came out a few years ago, this infuriating lay law, Yale law professor who wrote about her strategy for raising her children so they all turned into like concert violinists and got into Ivy League schools. And the thing is, what the reason that book, even though it infuriated a lot of people, it was very popular, is there's a difference between saying I succeeded at X and here's what I had to do to achieve X. Um, when only your mother and your spouse will care about the first one, but other people might might care about the second one. So the reason she wrote that book is not just to say, look how good my kids are, but like, here's the strategy I, I used to get these kids to be so successful. So a lot of times in these quality improvement reports, people just want to shout from the rooftops and say that they reduced something by 50%, but you don't really have any clear idea of how they, how they achieved that. So I would say that the two common failings in quality improvement sort of writing is there researchers often rush to a rigorous evaluation before the intervention is ready. And then the sort of QI types enthusiastically produce these lousy before or after studies um, that are unconvincing even when they're successful and they're totally pointless when they're unsuccessful. Uh, and so I think that both groups can um, really benefit from this idea of articulating a theory for their intervention. And I also sort of just, you know, I started off in clinical research. I mean, 
we all know about the consort guidelines for randomized control trials, and they're always billed as if they were writing guidelines, but realistically, they're blueprints for the research. I mean, you don't start writing a paper and go, oops, I should have double-blinded or adding a placebo group. Obviously, you need to think about that at the beginning. So even though they're billed as writing guidelines, they really are blueprints for how to do certain types of clinical trials. And so similarly, in quality improvement, thinking about the eventual writing enhances the design and the execution of the project itself. And so the, the, the three things I want to talk about most, and really just the first two actually for this talk, um, is having an explicit theory for why the intervention will work, and specifying the active ingredients of that intervention, and also outcomes that don't just measure the success of what you're trying to achieve, like reducing hospital-acquired infections maybe, but also capture the fidelity of the implementation, the degree to which your theory and your intervention played out as you expected. So again, improvements, as I say, the biggest symptom of there being no theory for an intervention is that people pick solutions without matching them to the problems. You know, we'll, have a le we'll do education, we'll have a clinical practice guideline, we'll do audit and feedback and send report performance report cards, or we'll create a new order set. I mean, each of these presupposes a certain type of problem. You know, order sets implies that the main problem is memory. Um, and, you know, for instance, you could do an order set for um, how to have more prudent antibiotic orders for septic patients. Uh, but the reality is if you're an intern at 2 in the morning and you've got a septic patient, you don't really worry about the public health consequences of your antibiotic choices. You just don't want this patient to die before 8 a.m. when the team comes in and can comment on how you're doing. Uh, and so the order set is irrelevant at that point. You haven't really understood what the real problem is. Similarly, if you do performance reports, that can be great for some things, but you know, I'm a hospital based general internist, if I get a performance report on my length of stay, it'll kind of annoy me because I'll feel like, first of all, all I try and certainly all the residents try to do is get the patients out of the hospital like hot potatoes. So if we don't get the patient out of the hospital because we don't have enough social workers or discharge planners or something else that I feel is beyond my control. But if you send me a report card on how quickly I do my discharge summaries or maybe how often I wash my hands, I'll acknowledge that that's under my control. So my point is, is that each of these solutions needs to address the right problem or the underlying problem. So sometimes, I mean, just thinking through how something is supposed to work makes you realize this isn't even a good idea to pursue in the first place. Um, so for those of you not into quality improvement, you may not realize that falls possibly second only to hand hygiene. It's just like, like I'm so sick of hearing about inpatient falls. Uh, so in any case, uh, as you may know, that nurses commonly screen patients for fall risk. So you ask, well, why will screening for fall risk work? And someone might say, you know, it seems sensible if we identify the subset of high-risk patients, so we can focus on them. Well, can you identify such a subset? Well, actually, most patients end up being high risk. So I'm a general internist at a hospital with a higher average age, maybe even than most general internal medicine, you know, like 85, 90. And so basically, everybody's old, everyone's fallen before, and everyone's on some five medications. So basically, 80% of our patients end up being at high risk for falls. Uh, what about bed alarms? How will bed alarms reduce falls? Well, nurses love nothing better than more alarms going off. So, what, so sometimes, as soon as you are articulate the theory, you realize, you know what, I'm just going to lay down and avoid this intervention. Um, but there are other times where, you know, really there are worthwhile interventions out there where, where still the theory isn't articulated, and once you articulate the theory, it actually can really help when you're either designing a local intervention or evaluating one. So every, I'm sure everyone's familiar with rapid response teams, you probably have one here, and as you probably know, the original theory for these teams was that there were, and a lot of this came from... Um, Australia, Pittsburgh, a couple of places. But anyway, now they're pretty widespread. But the idea was that especially in teaching hospitals, deteriorating patients were not recognized early enough, and the, war, the interns or residents were sometimes hard to reach. And then even when you reached them, they might have felt nervous about escalating the care to the appropriate attendings. And so the idea was to bypass that problem. But then as as this literature has evolved and the experience has evolved, um, it's also come out that, you know, one of the other problems is that transfers to ICU are often delayed when, um, because there's an adversarial relationship between the ICU staff and um, the ward team. And I have to say, having practiced in Canada and the U.S., I would say this is definitely true outside of the United States. You know, um, in Canada, in Australia, in the U.K., it's Physicians still can make fairly unilateral decisions that patients aren't appropriate for the ICU and they just don't like the look of a lot of general medicine patients. They're basically old and sick, have a lot of problems, and they're not going to do well and they don't really want to take them. 
And so there's a lot of arguments that can ensue. And so if you have a rapid response team that's made up of critical care physicians, then that actually changes. That changes the dynamic quite a bit. And many uh, hospitals experience a much more collaborative relationship. And even if mortality doesn't improve, everyone feels better about it. Um, another interesting, uh, so the, the reason that's important is that it has a very concrete implication for who should be on your rapid response team. And it also suggests something you might want to measure when you do an intervention, like whether the time to transfer sick patients is what's improving versus the earlier identification of patients. The last point, which has been made a couple of times in the literature, is that rapid response teams may make more patients DNR. So again, in, especially in Canada and Australia and the UK, where you can more unilaterally make these decisions, you know, just like in the United States, I think a lot of times at two in the morning, an intern who's never met this patient before doesn't feel comfortable saying, you know, we're admitting you for pneumonia, but by the way, if you get sick, or maybe we should, shouldn't resuscitate you. Uh, but critical care physicians love having conversations like that with people that they've never met. So basically, you call, you call, you call the critical care team, expecting them to help you with this patient, and they basically take the family side and say, you know, we should just make grandma comfortable. And so, um, in any case, the point is those patients stop being unexpected expected deaths. They start becoming expected deaths. So the de denominator changes dramatically. Now, obviously, I realize that there are legitimate reasons to have more people DNR. Uh, but it's a very different quality problem you've solved uh, by having people able to discuss DNR status. You haven't, like, saved a bunch of people's lives. Your numerator has not changed. Only your denominator has. Um, and again, it has a very important implication for how you, you should um, even do the intervention and certainly to evaluate it. Do you really need a bunch of people with critical care training or do you really need a bunch of people who are trained to discuss um, you know strategies for dealing with uh, acute illness and people who maybe shouldn't be resuscitated the point is that specifying these different theories has very concrete implications for how you both do the project and how you would evaluate it so I want to give an example about sort of how to flesh out the theory uh, of your intervention when you're considering it. And for those of you who are familiar with doing root cause analysis, it's a little bit like that. You've got sort of basic categories of things that could be contributing to the problem you're trying to solve. Organizational problems like infrastructure or staffing, equipment problems, professional issues like knowledge and skills and attitudes and memory, and then patient factors. And I'm going to illustrate it with the sort of time-honored problem of the overuse of antibiotics for upper respiratory tract infections. And so if you sort of think through why is it the people who shouldn't be getting antibiotics are getting them, you know, it's probably not a case of infrastructure problems. Now, that, that is a huge problem for many chronic illnesses. I mean, um, you know, I know that in, you know, primary care clinics, you, you're dealing with someone's lower back pain and there may be their workers' compensation issues. And then finally, at the end of the visit, and you're getting them out of the office, you know, you've forgotten about their diabetes ongoing chronic care. So it's, uh, or you don't have enough it's nurses to talk to them about their diabetes and to manage their chronic illness. And so it's like a combination of memory and infrastructure problems for a lot of chronic illnesses, but not when someone's sitting there saying, my throat is sore and I want some antibiotics. Um, so as I said, memory factors and infrastructure, probably not an issue. You know, attitudes and peer opinions, maybe, you know, how your colleagues practice might have an effect the way it does for a lot of other things. And maybe knowledge and skills. Some docs may think that they have these magical clinical skills that can identify who need antibiotics. But what about patient in this case? Well, that's probably a really big contribution. In fact, there have been studies about why people are in the waiting room, and the reason they're there for their visit is, I think I need antibiotics. How much do you want antibiotics today? Very much. So based on this... <laughs> Simple observation, somebody actually did a randomized trial where they just randomized people to be told that they had bronchitis, a viral illness, or a chest cold, and then measured how dissatisfied they were when they didn't get antibiotics. The people who were told they had bronchitis were quite dissatisfied. I mean, it's an itis of your bronchus. It sounds like you need antibiotics. <laughs> But then, you know, they know they don't need antibiotics for colds. So if you tell them they have a chest cold, they're, okay, I can live with that. And interestingly, viral illness is somewhere in between, you know, as I'm sure you all do too. You know, we often try to reassure patients with it, just a virus. But, you know, they've only ever heard of HIV and Ebola, so it's not really clear why that should be so reassuring. So it came out with these mixed results. But the point is, is that once you start figuring out why people are behaving a certain way or what the underlying problem is, you can make a much more sensible, um, you know, intervention. So now we have a theory for our intervention. What about the actual intervention itself? So returning to that mock uh, QI report, it mentioned something about staff education, clinical champions, and empowering patients to ask staff if they wash their hands. So, you know, you, 
a lot of times in quality improvement, people just forget everything about sort of regular clinical research. Like you'd never say, I just gave a small red pill to patients. You'd say like, what was in that pill? So like staff education about what? I mean, like just germs, germs are bad. Um, you, you know, what are clinical champions? Is it just a friend of yours who was willing to go around and say something nice about your project? Is it just a nurse whose back hurts too much to do clinical care? So she's been seconded to your quality improvement project, you know, or is it really somebody who's championing your project and is a local opinion leader? And wait a second, are you telling me you empowered patients to ask staff if they washed their hands? That sounds like a big deal. What exactly did you tell them and how did you support their doing so? So again, think about your quality improvement intervention like a pill. We'd never say we gave a small white pill to patients with chest pain. We'd say we gave aspirin, 225 milligrams to chew immediately and so on. So if those details don't matter for your education, it's probably because your education doesn't matter, right? If it doesn't matter to say what exactly you taught, uh, how often you did it, and what format you did it, then probably none of it really matters either. It's not even an active ingredient. If it matters, then you should really think through, um, you know, what you were doing, who these clinical champions were, how did you empower patients to, to talk to people, and so on. So, and just to play out this idea of how the thinking about the writing really helps how you would execute in the first place, if you imagine what you would write, then you start to realize, yeah, I really need to do the project that way. So education was delivered. This is, remember, a hand hygiene project. Education was delivered as a one-hour staff lunch with a 30-minute lecture. What was it covering? Well, it was covering specifically misconceptions about hand hygiene, not that germs are a bad thing and showing Petri dishes with a bunch of germs on them. We visited each ward once a month for three months to ensure adequate exposure. And clinical champions were chosen on the basis of this following. They were actually one of the ways that you can choose clinical champions or local opinion leaders. You just ask, do a survey about, you know, who would you ask about a difficult case or who would you send your mother, your father to, and then see who gets the most votes. But there are, there are ways to do it. And then for the patient empowerment, you know, nurses explain the empowerment policy to patients in the following way, and then investigators checked in with five patients per ward per day to ensure they had been informed. And the reason, once you start doing it that way, you also realize how your so-called PDSA or refinement cycles are going to work. So again, the education included 30 minutes for people to ask questions. So for instance, during the educational sessions, it became clear that many nurses still believed the hand hygiene gel would dry their hands. So we modified the educational material to address this misconception. Staff also expressed concerns about the frequency of the gel dispensers being empty or broken. And so you could imagine, then you're realizing, actually, you left something out of your intervention. That's a really important piece of feedback. And then in checking in with many patients, we noticed that many of them hadn't asked providers if they washed their hands. And in some cases, they had, and they didn't feel comfortable challenging staff, or they even had negative experiences. So the point is, is that attention to these types of issues and imagining ahead of time how you might write it up actually allows you to refine the project as you're implementing which is supposed to be the whole point of quality improvement so that some of these issues can really be addressed easily some of them you know like modifying the educational materials sometimes you realize oh my gosh we never really thought about the hand hygiene dispels who's actually taking care of that is it the nurses or is it the house cleaning staff and actually that's a common area of ambiguity and results and many of them remaining unfilled but you can definitely figure that out but you know other challenges you might realize is you know this patient empowerment thing I'm not really sure how it's going to play out we either really need to invest in this or maybe avoid it. Um, the point is, is that attention to these details will improve the intervention and the eventual report. And, you know, anyone who's done any, seen anything about quality improvement has seen this sort of PDSA cycle of improvement, and it makes it look so easy. Um, you know, it's actually quite hard in practice. Uh, but the other thing is, is that many people say they're doing it, but they don't actually do it. And um, we published this systematic review. Um, I mean, the journal that I edit, and they found that among 73 published QI projects claiming to have used PDSA, less than 20% even had these iterative cycles reportment of improvement, and only 15% reported the use of data that was even as frequently as monthly. So what the whole point idea in quality improvement is that you might use, collect data on a weekly or monthly basis and quickly see whether you're having problems in empowering patients to ask uh, if they've washed their hands or if the hand hygiene thing is working and then modify your intervention, um, but you need to be able to do that quickly. You can't get quarterly data and realize, oops, this thing isn't working at all. So the point is, is that don't just fake doing this, like actually do it. The other thing, getting back to the Rube Goldberg cartoon, is that, you know, the hospital is such a complicated place that sometimes the very act of trying to improve things actually makes things worse. And this is one of my favorite examples. It actually comes from the hospital where I now work in, but it was published before I worked there. So um, 
Sunnybrook Hospital was one of the epicenters of SARS. And um, one of my colleagues, um, because actually like everybody was wearing universal precautions for an entire year, and they started to wonder what the implications are for patient care. So even when SARS was over, they asked the question, um, how often do patients who are on isolated precautions for MRSA experience adverse events? So for those of you who don't know, adverse events is basically the technical jargon for iatrogenic events. I mean, something bad happened to the patient, and it was from their medical care, not from their underlying illness. So it's all the type of stuff that people talk about when they talk about adventure, uh, medical error. And so they found that isolated patients were twice as likely to experience adverse events as non-isolated patients. And it was an object observational chart review studies, so they can't prove the causality, but they also did note that isolated patients were more likely to have no vital signs recorded and no more days with no physician progress notes. And, you know, I'll admit that, especially in the summer when it's hot and I don't really feel like gowning up, it's easy to just stand in the doorway and ask if they have any chest pain. If they say no, I go on my way. Um, and so, you know, the point, it, ironically, the, the problem with, I'm obviously I'm not saying don't do universal precautions, uh, but the ironic thing is that if you adhere to universal precautions like only 80% of the time, you won't get the infection control benefit, but you probably will get the harm of not seeing patients as, as much. So, uh, but the point is, is that an unintended consequence of solving an infection control problem is that it makes it harder to care for patients in general. There's tons of other examples of unintended um, CPOE consequences, uh, EMR, you know, the copying and pasting in the EMR that people are starting to complain about, um, you know, entering orders for the wrong patients because they're a drop down list. There was actually an amazing case in Canada a little while ago of a uh, of a ward patient who had vecuronium ordered on him uh, because, as I mean, I'm sure it's the same here, you know, you can order from your call room if you've got a CPOE system. So someone covering the ICU pulled down um, an order to order vecuronium on a critical care patient and ended up ordering it for a ward patient. Um, and amazingly, all the safety checks that were supposed to happen after that happened. Um, like two nurses checked the infusion rate and that it was the right drug. And the patient started walking to the bathroom and collapsed and they actually called for the rapid response team. Um, and then, thank goodness, the nurse said to the team when they arrived, you know, it happened right after I hung this medication. Do you think that could be related? In any case, uh, the, the other, I mean, fall programs that reduce morbid, mobility, you know, it, the, e the easiest way to prevent falls is just don't let the patients out of bed. Um, so anyway, um, Oh, this is my all-time favorite, more of a, a research-level project. So this was a project from Alberta, where Calgary and Edmonton are, but they did it in Saskatchewan. They used um, the entire – Saskatchewan has a great administrative database. So they had um, 24,000 – it's a large province, but with a small number of people, like I think only a million people, basically all wheat. Um, but in any case, so they had 24,000 people with newly diagnosed diabetes. And they found that compared to patients just seen by their primary care doctor, patients seen by specialists were more likely to receive recommended treatments, but were also more likely to die. Now, the obvious research response to that is, oh, of course the specialists see sicker patients. But in fact, they didn't. Uh, they found the same relationship amongst all subjects, subjects with no coronary artery, subjects with no circulatory disease, no renal disease, no cerebral vascular disease, and basically when they excluded every possible disease, you still like being on seeing being seen on the right side was an increased risk of death from being seen by a specialist. So Alberta researchers find exposure to diabetes specialists in Saskatchewan harmful to patients. The Royal College considers removing diabetes content from training programs. <laughs> Saskatchewan's urge to remain calm. So, Siri, I mean, this is a really interesting case because I actually was a very well done research study. So, I mean, health services research always has the possibility of residual confounding, yada, yada, yada. But there are some plausible explanations. I mean, first of all, we do know that when diabetes specialists make multiple basically endocrinologists make, make multiple recommendations. The patients inadvertently renew their old prescriptions. The family doctor assumes the specialist has initiated other referrals, but a lot of times in Canada, a lot of times it's a very fragmented system, fee-for-service, and it's not really in the specialist's interest to make sure that anything else happens other than what they're focused on. Um, and so... Uh, and, you know, the, the real problem is is that the diabetes doctors don't really focus on what actually kills people with diabetes, right, which is their coronary artery disease or other cardiovascular problems. It's just like as long as their hemoglobin A1C is good, they're good. Um, so there's a real disconnect between process measures and outcomes. 
Um, and actually, just, just to wrap it up, this brings up a general problem with outcomes and quality improvement projects um, that I see a lot, um, both as an editor and someone helping people locally. So one of them is that people measure processes unlike hemoglobin A1C, but that have literally no known connection with any kind of outcome. So like a typical paper might be, we did a handover project and the average handover quality increased from 2.7 before the intervention to 4.8 afterwards, P equals 0.05. Like, I don't really know what any of that means. Like, I mean, I know that there's like some functional status scores that I also don't know what they mean, but I know they've been validated to something like your Karnofsky performance score or, or MS score, stuff like that. Like that's just a case of my can't remember, but these ones, I nobody knows what the handover quality score um, uh, correlates with. Then there's other ones where, in principle, there's a connection to improved outcomes, but in practice, there probably isn't. So smoking cessation is a good example. There's tons of randomized trials that show that when you really care about getting people to quit smoking, you can make them quit smoking. The problem is when you turn it into a routine process, it's too easy to just tick off, yeah, I mentioned that they should quit smoking, and it's not going to really make anything happen. Um, then there's outcomes that don't tell the whole story, you know, discharge, like length of stay but not readmissions is an obvious one, but I've been noticing more and more of this discharges by noon thing. Um, so I know, I understand why people care about discharges by noon because it affects the planning of the day, but the easiest way to discharge someone by noon is to not discharge them this afternoon and wait till tomorrow morning to discharge them. So if you just report your discharge by noon, like you have no idea if you've actually improved things, you know, cardiac arrests on the ward, again, return to the rapid response team literature. I mean, there are a lot of studies that when you start looking at them closely, they're still having the same rate of cardiac arrest. They're just arresting in the unit and dying in the unit instead of on the ward. And um, outcomes that depend on clinical behavior is an interesting one. There was just last week a paper in JAMA that was really cool. Um, I'd actually been worried about this for central line infections too, and then someone did the same study sort of for VTE rates. So the idea was, um, as we all know, VTE prophylaxis, I mean, it's almost like we're adding low molecular weight heparin to the water now for general internal medicine patients. Um, so basically, everybody's on VTE prophylaxis. So they did this study with two large databases to find out if VTE prophylaxis adherence correlated with actual VTE rates. Interestingly, the places that did better at prophylaxis had higher VTE rates. Interesting. It's the opposite direction. Um, but they also noticed that increased imaging was associated with increased VTE. And they did a really nice study that showed that if you were in the lowest quartile of imaging, you were also in the lowest quartile of VTE. And as you basically, the more you look, the more you find. Um, and, you know, I've noticed this just personally. I mean, it used to be like when I was a resident, it seemed like all you did for inpatients was work them up for DVT and PE. It's like, oh, they're not doing well. Maybe they have a PE or a DVT, right? So basically, everybody was constantly getting ultrasounds and uh, you know CTs and so on um, once they'd been in the hospital for a few days. Uh, but then once we started losing low molecular heparin, it just sort of went lower down. We just assumed that they weren't at risk for it. Um, and I mean, I know that you know these are effective treatments, but it is possible that um, sometimes if you're going to do a quality improvement project, for instance, where you're looking at your impact on VTE rates, and if that's dependent, you've got an ascertainment or surveillance bias problem. I think the same thing probably happens with the famous central line bundle. Um, that you know, it's the easiest way to have less central line infections is to send fewer blood cultures. And if you've just implemented a central line bundle and you think it's working, it's quite possible you will check fewer blood cultures. And none of the studies um, that have looked at this have examined that. And the reason I've been worried about it is we actually published a big UK trial that repl tried to replicate the Michigan one. And it, it actually had a control group and found that the control group's rate of central line bloodstream infections decreased to the same rate as the intervention group. Um, so either that there was important secular trends or maybe people just stopped ordering blood cultures as much. I'm not really sure. In any case, it's an interesting example of um, a more subtle but important problem with outcomes. But on, a, on the other hand, uh, ending on a positive, positive note, well-chosen outcomes can sometimes overcome interest, uh, possible design limitations. This was a great non-funded study from Dartmouth, a non-funded meeting. It was just like the quality improvement department with a thoughtful ID doc uh, got together and did this returning to the hand hygiene one. So they were trying to improve hand hygiene rates and reduce healthcare associated infections. They did an interrupted 
time series over three years, and they reported a, you know, a big improvement in hand hygiene compliance, but it also went with an improvement in healthcare-associated infections. And when I first saw it, I was like, yeah, like, you know, I'm just sort of waiting to find out what the problem is with the outcome going to be. Uh, but it turned out it was a really nice study. So first of all, for those of you who haven't seen it, this is what, like a run chart, it's called. And what's nice about it is it shows how the hand hygiene compliance is improving over time. Whoops. Sorry. I just wanted to use the pointer. Okay. Uh, in any case. You can see it goes from 41%, then it goes up to 64%, 79%, 87, 91. And, you know, the, which is quite plausible too. Like a lot of studies, you'll just see a before after study where it suddenly went from like 30% to 90%. What's also nice is they annotate it with the different parts of the interventions. And so, of course, you still can't say causality, but they're acknowledging that when you do a multifaceted intervention, you don't know whether all this stuff works. And one of the ones that I get a kick out of, for instance, you know how like they always say, senior leader support. So the leader signed the commitment letter when they were already at 87%. So basically, they just saw a good thing and said, sure, you got our approval. So then they report their healthcare associated infections. And sorry, you, basically, you can see there's a big drop in healthcare associated infections. And interestingly, you can, if you look at the dates, which I know you can't see, this is roughly when they hit 87% in the hand hygiene. So that's starting to look good. And then as an extra kicker, as a design thing, they showed that their staph aureus rate in the operating room didn't go down. So as we all know, surgeons already wash their hands. So if you do a hand hygiene campaign, it shouldn't affect your operative infections. Uh, and in fact, the reviewers, the only thing the reviewers were concerned about was why there's a little bit of an uptick in the operating room. And they were able to reassure people that it was like unrelated and just a random uptick. But the point is, is that this was a nice example of using um, a, a, an extra outcome, namely an outcome, sort of a control outcome to overcome some of the secular trends or other things that people might wonder about. And so a general strategy for outcomes, you want kind of a range of outcomes, often including quantitative and qualitative ones. So for instance, the proportion of staff who reported asking if at least one, you know, that, that they'd been asked by a patient if they washed their hands. Uh, patients who reported any negative interactions with staff. Obviously your monthly hand hygiene rates, and then your nosocomial infection rates, including ones not expected to change from the intervention. And again, I mean, I know people often worry about funding and quality improvement. I'm not saying it's not an issue, but this is all pretty routinely available data. Everybody has an infection control department. They, with a little bit of help, they can sort out these different infections. Most people are investing in auditing hand hygiene. So you can get all this data. It's not like you require a multi-million dollar external grant to, to do this work. So just to conclude, a good evaluation plan increases the chance of success. I think the main things to do are to articulate a theory for the intervention and make sure it matches the problem you're trying to solve. Clearly specify the intervention's active ingredients um, and then a complementary range of, of, of outcomes. And then for the real researchers in the audience, I guess I would just say that, I mean, I came from a research background and the IHI and a lot of other people who get really enthusiastic and rah, rah, rah kind of drove me crazy. Um, and they still do a little bit. But I also recognize that the researchers, our big Achilles heel is that we rush to doing randomized trials a bit too quickly. Um, for a lot of quality improvement projects, it's more important to make sure you've got the right ingredients, you've addressed the implementation barriers. Don't do a lousy before after study, maybe do a time series. Like, don't do a lousy project, but don't a rigorous evaluation of something that's not ready for prime time is useless. Um, it's a lot different than in clinical research. In clinical research, we've got drugs that are being given to millions of patients. And we don't know if they work, and someone wants to do a randomized trial. If it doesn't work, that's still valuable information. But in quality improvement, no one's heard of your intervention. You do a lousy job developing it, and then do a rigorous evaluation to show that it's lousy. You haven't helped anybody. Nobody had even heard of your intervention. Just wait to tell us about it when it's ready. And then once a few people are interested in it, then we can do a randomized trial. So with that, I'm, thanks very much, and I'm very happy to take any questions. That was a wonderful, that was wonderful, thank you. Um, uh, and as a researcher who has not been impressed by quality improvement efforts or, or the evidence to support them, 
um, one, you know, one of the issues that we address is what works and what doesn't work, and you talked a lot about that. So if, if we were trying to improve care at the University of Washington Medical Center, what are the five things that we should do? You mentioned falls. Everybody's going to fall. Don't fo focus on that. What are the five things that we should be doing in terms of quality improvement that you think will really impact patient outcomes? Yikes, what an easy question. <laughs> How do you cure cancer? Hmm, let me think. Now, I guess, so there's a part of me that feels there are certain strategies that are worth investing in. Um, the, okay, the big problem we have in quality improvement is that there are some cross-cutting problems that are easy to identify, but we don't have solutions for them. Uh, um, you know, like actually, some, or, you know, adverse drug events or communication problems. These are often heterogeneous problems with different interventions. I guess I would say there is something to be said for picking a couple of things, often in maybe in informatics would be one of them, but actually doing a good job in investing in having like discrete useful evaluated interventions. Actually, a colleague of mine, I mean, I know UW has a pretty good informatics program, although last time I was here, there was like six different EMRs or CPOE systems, and there was like a whole house staff handbook on how to use each one. That struck me as inefficient, to say the least. Uh, so um, anyway, I guess what, what, what the problem that a lot of places have had with informatics, I think that many of us know, or maybe you don't, because you were probably once an early early adopter and then that got you into trouble and you had this like hodgepodge of systems that were like being held together with shoelaces it sounds like. Um, in any case, um, what my colleague and a couple of the people I know in Informax have started to do is to really focus on understanding the clinical workflow and then instead of promising an entire new system, they develop a system that does a very specific thing very well and integrates with the um, you know, the, the main system, so it isn't, uh, like, so for instance, to give example, I mean, this may not speak to you because I, I don't know how your system works, but, you know, when we're, when the resident is on call, or, and the attending with them, overnight, they get, like, 30 general medicine costs, and they're really sick patients, and they're just, like, loosely on pieces of paper that if you lose the description, it's, like, gone, and you have no idea where this patient is or what they had or anything. So he developed the program first to like automate that process and it appeared in everyone's smartphone. Then he developed a template for the consult. Then he like inter basically starting to build things that the clinicians cared about, but at the same time building in things like medication reconciliation and other things. So I think like using IT smartly is one thing. And there's probably teamwork training. There are actually studies that show a reduction in mortality and they're not lousy studies, but you have to, it's like a very intensive form of teamwork. There was actually a nice JAMA paper on it. So there probably are a couple of cross cutting things, but I actually think the type of thing that I've been talking about today is the more sensible strategy for a lot of things because most quality problems are idiosyncratic to that institution. I mean, it's fine to say, handover is a problem or teamwork or communication is a problem, but the reality is a lot of it does depend on local processes. So having clinicians who are engaged in this with some training in it um, to work on those problems does serve a useful purpose. I also think that, yeah, eventually 10 or 20 years from now, we may be at the point where you can say, what's your top evidence-based list? But right now, we need to just engage people in feeling that they've actually improved things. I think it's just as important to improve the quality of our own work as the actual outcomes for patients. And I know everyone's supposed to be patient-centered care and all this stuff, but as a general internist, maybe I just have surgeon envy, but I think, like, no one's designed this system for me either. They always say it's not designed for the patients, but it's also not designed for me. Like, I'm, like, bumping into another patient. The nurse never does what I'm asking her to do. Like, I, I have this idea that maybe in surgery, when they say to do stuff, stuff actually happens happens, but nothing in medicine seems to actually happen just because I want it to happen. So I feel like I, I feel like it'd be really nice if we could redesign this system to make our work better, engage people, and also improve outcomes for patients. And then eventually, I think we'll be at the point where someone can say, like, medication reconciliation or central line bundles or whatever it is. But actually, there's very few of those things right now. Sorry it took so long. I know there was another question over there. Steve. Oh, that, that was just a, uh, a delightful and I think... Um, um, very accurate discussion. One, there's one sort of strategy that you didn't mention, which I see crop up all the time, and I'd love your um, Lean. thoughts. No worse in some ways. <laughs> uh, and, and as I mentioned, we're off to a, uh, a, a departmental retreat uh, in a few hours to discuss this strategy. Um, and, and that's one we see frequently where someone develops a measure 
And then they put that measure out there and think magically that things are going to improve because of the measure. Mm -hmm. And I just would love your sort of generic comments about that uh, general strategy. I guess, I mean, I question it. I mean, I question the strategy. I mean, for a variety of reasons, I mean, I think that uh, historically a couple of things th – this debate about measurement has been around for a while. I mean, there's the usual, just like we see with our children in school, about what you just play for the test, the gaming, all that kind of stuff. But I do think in healthcare there's other issues too, which is that, you know, we measure things sometimes that are easy, but they're not necessarily things that physicians care about, like, a, like you know, like hospital – standardized mortality it's like too generic or you know readmissions or even like medication errors or in nosocomial infections like no one goes to work to wash their hands that's not why i get up in the morning and so if infection nosocomial infection becomes the big measure it's like it doesn't speak to why i became a cardiologist or endocrinologist so one of the problems with measurement is it's very hard to measure things that people actually care about um the, the, and so I mean, I think in some ways, um, and then these big dot measures are, are frankly ludicrous. I mean, like, the idea that a hospital is going to reduce its overall mortality. I mean, like we spend trillions of dollars trying to develop a drug that reduces like breast cancer mortality by like 1%. And suddenly a hospital is just going to galvanize itself and re reduce its all-cause mortality. It's absurd. I mean, all they'll do is just say more people had COPD and hypertension and diabetes and their risk adjustment profile will change. Um, or they'll discharge people to, to die elsewhere, which almost certainly happens. Uh, but in any case, my point is, is that I think one of the problems with measurement is when it's held out there as if it were a solution, is that in order to measure something effectively, you sort of strip away all the things that make it interesting, or it cuts across so many different disciplines that actually no one really cares about, about it. Uh, on the other hand, it is very true what the management guys always say, and I'm, you know, I'm sometimes sick of hearing it too, but you manage what you measure. And so you do have to sometimes turn around to the same clinicians who protest HSMR or readmissions rates and say, well, tell me one thing you really do care about and we'll help you measure it. So, you know, if the GI guys want to start measuring the time to endoscopy for acute hemorrhage, we'll support them and we'll measure it. And that sort of thing. I think that's the solution is for the next 10 years, um, our department is sort of thinking about this too. Like, let's get each division in the department to nominate one thing that they care about and that they're not already doing super well on and then try to support them doing that. So that's my answer. I think uh, one of the things that I uh, that I found most interesting was um, your talk about using negative controls in a study design. And from a laboratory-based background, you know, negative controls are necessary to have proper interpretation of results. But I mentioned that it's harder in sort of QI projects to come up with uh, an appropriate negative control. But I think it's very important if you really want to make your results uh, uh, valid. And and um, what are your thoughts about this? So it's a huge issue. I mean, the, the times where that run chart that I showed with the hand hygiene, I mean, there were so many different interventions that it, 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 it's that even though they were correlating with the steps, it, it isn't in the end as convincing. But the... The idea with these long interrupted time series is that if you do have an intervention that's sort of like a light switch, which admittedly a lot of interventions aren't, but like if you turn on a new decision or to support thing, or you just if you do something that doesn't take a long time to implement, then you can with a time series with enough data points see that yeah there was a sharp change and it's exactly when we did this thing and basically nothing else was going on. That starts to be plausible, um, but you're right. A lot of other times you need negative controls. Um, there was a, actually a young ID fellow did a very nice project um, in the masters that we run where he did something to re reduce the treatment of asymptomatic bacteria, and he, um, they they weren't intervening on the catheterized patients, and they but they used that as their negative control, and it was a very nice study. Of course, it required a little bit more work, um, but that was much more plausible um, when you saw that. Like there was this huge drop in the treatment rate of unnecessary antibiotics for asymptomatic bacteria in hospitalized patients, and the control group stayed the same. So I do think, and I try to tell this to people, is that you know, you're, unless your intervention is like a light switch, you're going to need um, to collect some other data. Otherwise, you just won't know. I mean, there's so many things because uh, a lot of projects, like in the critical care units and stuff, like where there really are other things going on. Like you do a VAP reduction project a project and it turns out that like the hospital that used to do neurotrauma closed and they're sending all their patients to 
you now and like other stuff was happening where you really could have a change in the patient population or there were other things going on, national campaigns, things you haven't even thought about. Um, so I do think that unless you can really show that there was a discrete time at which your intervention affected, you have tons of data, like time series, and there was a clear drop, then you probably will need uh, some kind of control group. Over there. I think you make a very good argument that a lot of the quality improvement literature isn't particularly as rigorous as it should be. I'm curious in your own institution and others that you've seen, how you help trainees learn quality improvement when many of the people doing it aren't doing it as rigorously as they could. It's a great question. So um, we focused a lot on trainees. Um, and one of the things we noticed in the literature on QI for trainees is that there was two problems. One is they often felt um, unsupported and they had to like work really hard and no faculty was helping them, you know, open doors or grease wheels or then even if they were, it was very disheartening that as soon as they left, the project died. Um, so what we did to try to solve those problems is we developed a long, one of my call, my first mentee, a young faculty person um, now, uh, Brian Wong, has done some really great work on this. So we developed a co-learning program for the faculty and the residents in three subspecialties. I think it was endocrine, nephro, and onc were the first three. And it was a longitudinal program where the division supplied a minimum of one, but two faculty members usually, who would actually learn with the residents, because they, you know, most of the faculty don't know anything about quality improvement either. Um, and they would help the residents choose their project, not like authoritatively, but or authoritarianly, but say, you, you know, we'll support you with this project. So then we achieved two goals. One is that we had had the faculty being aware of the residents' efforts and often providing some support for it. And we created mentors for a lot of the, because um, now actually it's in 13 subspecialty programs. So the program was so successful in the first year that six more subspecialty, the fellows actually asked to be to be involved. So we, then we had nine, now we have 13. So that means that um, we've had a total of 80 residents and about 25 faculty members the past three years do longitudinal QI projects and get training in this. Um, we've also developed a master's program for the, the sort of siphoning off some of the MPH types. So a lot of young resident, you know, clinicians sort of like they're research or scholarly oriented, but they don't want to just become an expert in one little thing. They want to fix the broken system in which they work. Um, and so instead of going off and doing just like a master's of science in Clinepi, they're doing a master's that's focused on quality improvement with us. And so we, we actually, within our um, department, we had, um, we have like 15 new faculty members who all came out of that program, but we also have a resident group of about 30 or 40 people who were from, our program is similar in size to UW. It's a very big program and it's scattered over some hospitals. But anyway, uh, I think this is huge. I mean, I also am reminded too that, you know, uh, the, I don't just say this, that the residents of the future, but you know, like Max Planck uh, once said, famous physicist, that scientists don't change their mind, they just die. Uh, and so that really, <laughs> you need the younger generation to come along. And you see that a lot, like um, sometimes you do get mid-career and senior people who suddenly go, wow, this quality improvement stuff is important. But the reality is, is you just need the new generation to come along. And so we really have focused a lot in training the residents and providing support for them. I think we're probably out of time, is that?